Revelation chapter 6. Is Revelation a hard book to understand? No. It's the one book of the Bible with the divine what? Outline. Chapter 1, verse what? 19. 19. <laughs> Luke, yes. Chapter 1, verse what? 19. 19. Jesus says to John, write the things which you have seen. That's chapter 1. Speaks of Jesus revealed. It isn't the revelation of eschatology or the end times. No, it is the revelation of Jesus revealed and unveiled like a bride on a wedding day. The revelation of Jesus. That's chapter 1. Chapters 2 and 3, write the things which are, Jesus said. That's chapters 2 and 3. Speaks of Jesus rebuilding the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's not your job or my job to build a church. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's not Phil Comer's church. It's Jesus's church. And Jesus in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 rebuilds the church with seven letters to seven churches that fell apart. He rebuilds the church. One letter, one sentence, one word at a time. That's chapters 2 and 3. Third, Jesus said, write the things which will take place after this. That's chapters 4 through... That's chapters 4 through 22. Chapters 4 and 5 speak of Jesus redeeming the earth. The earth is bankrupt because of sin. There in heaven, there is a scroll sealed with seven seals. We talked about that a week ago. It's the title deed, if you would, to the earth that is bankrupt because of sin. Who is worthy to open the scroll? That's the question of chapter 5. The answer, there's no one in heaven or earth worthy. There is one. Jesus is worthy because Jesus paid the price. Jesus bought back the earth. He didn't pay with silver and gold. No, he paid with his flesh and with his blood. He bought back the earth and he redeemed you and he redeemed me. That's chapters four and five. What happens next? Tonight is the night. Chapters six through 19 speak of the great tribulation. But there is nothing great. <laughs> there is nothing good about the tribulation. What is the tribulation? You might be saying to yourself. Seven years Seven awful, agonizing, morbid, miserable years of hell on earth, of God's wrath poured out like fire on a field in August. God's wrath poured out on a world that rejected Jesus Christ. The world said, we will not have this man reign over us, Luke 19. We won't have this man, this Jesus, we will not have him reign over us. But Galatians says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, this he shall also reap. In the tribulation, the world reaps what it sows. God's wrath is poured out on the world that rejected Jesus Christ. But why, you might be saying to yourself, why would a God of grace and a God of mercy pour out his wrath for seven years on the world. For the same reason, I believe, that God poured out for 33 years his love on the world to save people. A couple of years ago, I, yes, the one and only John Mark, trained to be a lifeguard. I work with kids all summer long and we're around water, we're around pools and lakes and rivers, and I thought it wise to train to be a lifeguard. So there I was the YMCA in Medford, Oregon. Man, the YMCA is great. Training to be a lifeguard. And the first thing they taught me there at the YMCA was when a kid is drowning, dying there in the water, going under. Man, and when you swim out to save that kid's life, if they are frantic, chances are they will be, if they are freaked out, chances are they will be. The first thing you do, John Mark, you make a fist with your bony little fingers and your toothpick of an arm. You make a fist, you aim for the eyes, you punch them in the face and you knock their lights out. 
What? Yes. Right for the eyes, man. Aim for the eyes. Punch them in the face. And unconscious, save their lives. Because if you don't punch them in the face, chances are they're going to punch you in the face and they're going to drown you. So punch them in the face. Knock their lights out to save their lives. The tribulation is God. A God of grace and mercy making a fist. Aiming for the eyes. Punching the world in the face. Knocking the world out because the world is drowning and dying in sin. The wages of sin is death. The tribulation is God's knockout punch. Man, trying to save the world that rejected Jesus Christ. A last ditch chance to save the world that rejected Jesus. That's the tribulation. Man, will I be here? Will I get my lights punched out by Jesus? Will, I, will there be wrath poured out on me? No. Because you remember a couple weeks ago, chapter 4, verse 1, the church is raptured. We are caught up forever to be with the Lord in the air. Jesus raptures the church. We're caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord. That's why you do not read the word church. It's nowhere to be found in chapters 6 through 19. The word church does not exist in chapters 6 through 19. And that's why in chapter 13, you can turn there, verse 9, you read, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Period. The second half of that phrase, which is what the Spirit says to what? The churches. To what? The churches. That phrase is in the Gospel of John and Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. But chapter 4, church is raptured. Here in chapter 13, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Not what the Spirit says to the church because the church isn't in the tribulation. No, the church is in heaven. Here on earth, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. The scripture says God has not appointed us to wrath in 1 Thessalonians, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God hasn't appointed you, Christian, to seven years of God's wrath poured out on a Christ-rejecting world because you have not rejected Christ. You have received Christ, Christian. I pray every man and woman right here, right now, has received Jesus. And God has appointed you for eternal life to be saved through Jesus Christ our Lord. But here on the earth, seven years of tribulation. That's chapter 6 through 19. Chapters 19 and 20 speak of the second coming of Christ, the millennial. We'll talk about that. Chapters 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. Is it a hard book to understand? No. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now, I saw when the Lamb... That's Jesus. Opened one of the seals. We talked about the scroll sealed with seven seals, the title deed to the earth. Jesus, the one worthy to take the scroll from the hand of God to redeem the earth. Jesus opens one of the seals. And verse 1, I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. With a voice like Jeremy Camp. Come and see. A voice like thunder. Thunder signals a storm. When you hear thunder, you run and hide. There is a storm on the horizon. Seven years of tribulation. Run and hide. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, said, When you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, we're going to talk about that in a week or two, then... Let those who are in Judea flee or run to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. No, hide. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation. Such has has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. In the tribulation, run, hide, there shall be great tribulation. A voice like thunder saying, come and see. And verse two, I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow, like a bow and arrow. And a crown was given to him. 
and he went out conquering and to conquer. The first seal, if you're taking notes, the first of the seven seals is a white horse bringing the Antichrist. There is a man riding a white horse, but he is no knight in shining armor. No, he is a man of the night. He's a man of darkness and depravity and deception. He is the Antichrist. He has a bow, but no arrows. Did you read that? He has a bow symbolizing power, but no arrows. In other words, he's a peacemaker. He is a powerful peacemaker, the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 8, you can turn there with me, prophesies of the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 8, biblical calisthenics, if you have a Bible. Prophesies of the Antichrist and says in Daniel eight twenty three. A king shall arise, speaking of Antichrist, having fierce features, in other words, the build of a Brad Pitt, who understands sinister schemes, the political prowess of a Franklin Roosevelt. His power, verse 24, shall be mighty. The oratorical skill of a Winston Churchill, the lasting likability of a JFK, the Antichrist is a man of power and might. But, verse 24 says, not by his own power. He is powered and he is possessed by Satan. And he deceives the world. He shall destroy, verse 24 says, fearfully. He shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. He shall destroy and decimate, murder, and martyr the Christians. Through his cunning, Daniel 8.25 says, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. Because he is possessed by Satan, Jesus said, you are the father of lies, Satan, and a deceiver. And the liar and the deceiver possesses the Antichrist. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Speaking of the future, speaking of after this, speaking of the tribulation. Turn the page. Daniel 9, verse 27, prophesies of Antichrist, says, Then... He shall confirm a treaty or a peace treaty with many for one week, seven days, symbolizing seven years, the tribulation. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. He shall break the peace treaty. What is that talking about? Antichrist, stay with me. Powerful peacemaker, right? Bow, but no arrows. He has the skill of Churchill. He's built like Brad Pitt. And there he is, a world leader. He brings all of the world together, Europe, Africa, America, China, all of the world together. And he signs a peace treaty with the world. There will be, for a year or two or three, peace in the Middle East. There will not be roadside bombs in Iraq. There will not be suicide bombers in Israel. There will not be Palestinians in the Gaza Strip fighting Israelis. There will not be bombs in trains and buses in London. No, there will be peace, worldwide peace and prosperity for a year or two. But the Antichrist will break that peace treaty. Oh, he's a man like Brad Pitt, like JFK. But he is a deceiver. He deceives the world. People think, ah, oh, he's a great guy. Look, look at that guy, a powerful peacemaker. But he deceives the world because, back to chapter 6 of Revelation, because he is the first of four horsemen in chapter 6, the first of seven seals open. Verse 3, back to the story. When Jesus opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. And another horse, this one fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. The first seal, the Antichrist, if you're taking notes. The second seal is war. 
a black horse bringing, excuse me, a red horse bringing war. There will be war in the tribulation. Nation will rise against nation. Brother against brother. Father against son. There will be war. Where does war come from? A lot of people in downtown Portland ask that question. That question is in the Bible. It doesn't have Birkenstocks and congas all around it. But that question, without tie-dye t-shirts and the smell of pot, that question is in the Bible. Turn to James chapter 4. James 4 verse 1 asks the question, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Where do wars come from? Do they not? Here's the answer. James 4 verse 1. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? War, whether it's in the Middle East or in Africa or in the United States of America, war comes from a desire for pleasure, for power or property or political prestige. It comes from a desire for pleasure. Verse 2 of James 4 says, You lust and do not have. You murder and you covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Not talking about asking George Bush or asking Saddam Hussein. Talking about asking God. You ask, verse 3, and do not receive because you ask amiss. You ask the wrong question. That you may spend it on your pleasures. You ask for money instead of asking for things money can't buy. You ask for power instead of asking for peace and purity and perseverance. You ask amiss. Adulterers, verse 4, and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Did you, did you read that? Did you, did you hear that? Whoever makes friends with the world makes himself an enemy of God. The church is ah, confused and compuzzled right now. I hear the verse, be in the world and not of the world. That's in the Bible. I hear that verse used and abused week after week after month after year. Be in the world and don't be of the world. People say, be in the world. Okay, man, I'm going to be in the world. I'm going to go to the bar. And I'm going to be Jesus. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go to the dance, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to party hardy like Jesus. I'm going to be in the world. That isn't saying go be in the world. You are in the world. You are in PCC. You do go to school or you do go to work or you do go to the job site with your hammers and your nails. You are in the world. The verse is saying don't be of the world. In other words, go to Starbucks or go to work or go to school or go home, be in the world, but don't be of the world. Don't befriend the world. That isn't saying be in the world. You are in the world. That's saying don't be of the world. Don't make friends with the world. James 4, 5 says, do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? God is jealous when we are friends with the world. And I'm not talking just about friends with a non-Christian. I'm talking about friends with your TV or friends with your CD player or friends with the Warp Tour or friends with the world. Do not befriend the world. That's what the scripture is talking about. Be in the world, don't be of the world because Jesus is jealous. Jesus said, I have called you what? Friends. Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is jealous, but James 4, 6 says he gives more grace. Therefore, verse 7, submit to God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God. Don't draw near to the world or the warp tour. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. But there is a war, brothers and sisters. It isn't in Iraq and Afghanistan right now. It's right here and right now. There is a war waging in your soul. One side is fighting for friendship with the world. The other side, fighting for friendship with God. One side is fighting for power and pleasure. 
The other side is fighting for peace and purity. Fight the good fight of faith, Christian. Onward, Christian soldiers. Take the helmet of salvation and fight. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and fight. Take the breastplate and take the waistband of truth and fight the good fight of faith. You are, the Scripture says, more than conquerors through Him who loved us. War in your soul. But there will be war in the tribulation. Back to Revelation 6. That's the second seal, war. Third seal, verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius that do not harm the oil and the wine. The third seal, a black horse bringing famine. The third seal, if you're taking notes, is famine. A quart of wheat, that was one meal in the days of John for a denarius. That was one day's wages. In other words, you do the math. You work all day long for a denarius to buy one meal. There is a famine. There is a depression. The economy is down the tubes. You work an all day for one meal for bread. That's the bad news. But the good news is Jesus said, man shall not live by what? Bread alone but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. You might be poor in the pocketbook, but you are not poor in the word of God. No, you are rich in things that money cannot buy. The word of God. Eat of the word of God, my friends. Feed on the faithfulness of God. Taste and see the Lord is good. Like the old man and the old woman who walked into McDonald's. This is great. They walked in one night to have dinner at McDonald's. And they walked in hand in hand. And there was a young man thinking to himself, oh, that's great. Couple, been married, who knows, 50, 55, 60 years. And they walked up and, and ordered one hamburger, and one French fry, and one Coca Cola. And they sat down, and, and the man cut the hamburger in half and gave half to his wife. And, Cut the French fries in half and gave half to his wife. And, and there was the Coca-Cola in the middle of the table, half for him, half for his wife. And the man started to eat, started to eat the hamburger and the French fries. But the woman was watching the man. She was not eating, looking down at the table. The young man there at McDonald's watching the, the old couple, his heart broke. And, and he got up out of his seat and he said, oh, sir and ma'am, I... I don't mean to be rude, but I want to buy you dinner. You don't have enough money to, to buy two meals. I want to buy you dinner. And the lady said, oh, young, young sonny, that's okay. That's okay. We share everything. Are you sure? Yes, we share everything. Okay. The young man sat back down in his seat. The old man continued to eat the hamburger and the french fries, continued to drink. And the old woman continued to stare at the table. and She wasn't eating. And the young man couldn't stand it any longer. He got back up and said, ma'am, please, I know you share everything, but what are you waiting for? The old woman said, his teeth. <laughs> Get it? His teeth. They share everything. His teeth, the hamburger, the french fries. His Sink your teeth into the word of God. <laughs> Eat the word of God. You shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. There will be famine in the tribulation. That's the third seal. Fourth seal, verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse, pale and sickly. And the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with them. The power was given them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The fourth seal, if you're taking notes, a pale and sickly horse bringing death. One fourth of the earth will die. That means a minimum of two billion people will die. Think of all of South America and Europe dying in the tribulation. 
But Paul the Apostle said, I die what? Daily. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Die, my friends. Die to your sin. Die to yourself. Die to your dreams and your desires and your vision and your ambitions. Die. And you won't die in the tribulation. No, you will live in heaven. You will live the resurrected life if you die. You will live life and life abundant. But there will be death in the tribulation. That's the fourth seal. Fifth seal, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. The fifth seal, if you're taking notes, martyrs. Millions and millions of men, women, and children will be saved in the tribulation. Church is in heaven, but they will be knocked out and they will be saved. But Christians in the tribulation will be like Jews in the Holocaust. They will be hunted like animals. They will be murdered and massacred and they will be martyred for faith in Jesus. And they, the martyrs, verse 10 cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? It's a great question. How long, O Lord? We were murdered. We were brutalized and beat up, raped and ravished, massacred. How long, God? until you avenge our deaths? That was the martyr's question. Maybe that's your question. How long, O oh Lord, till this is going to work out in my life? How long, God, till you're going to bring me my wife or my husband? How long, God, until you're going to give me a vision for my life? How long, God, until you're going to answer this prayer? It's been years. How long, God, until, until you're going to take me there? That's all my heart. How long, God? Maybe that is your prayer. Maybe you wonder. With the other Americans that wonder. Here's some things Americans wonder about. Ever wonder. While the sun lightens our hair but darkens our skin. It's crazy. Why women can't put on mascara with their mouth closed. <laughs> Why is abbreviated such a long word? Why is it that doctors, this is great, call what they do practice? <laughs> Why is the man who invests all your money or your parents' money called a broker? Why is the time of day when the slowest traffic called rush hour? Why isn't there mouse flavored cat food? And why do they sterilize the needle for lethal injections? Why are they called apartments when they are all stuck together? And if flying is so safe, why do they call the airport the terminal? <laughs> Ever wonder about America, about life, about your husband? Is he out there? Your wife? Is there a wife? About vision for your life? What am I going to do? About unanswered prayers? Are you going to answer that prayer? How long, O oh Lord? Read verse 11. Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. The Christians murdered and martyred. How long was the question? It was said to them, rest. Rest. For a little while, rest. Psalm 37 verse 7 says to you and, and says to me, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Rest in the Lord. For how long until I'm going to marry you? Rest. Wait patiently for the Lord. But how long until oh, his prayer is going to be answered? Wait patiently. Be still and know that He is God. Rest in the Lord. 
Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and he heard my cry. Wait for the Lord. Rest, my friend. If that's you, how long, O oh Lord? If that's you or me, how long? Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be still and know that he is God. For how long? Until both the number of their fellow servants, verse 11, and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. Until the work is completed. Philippians 1, verse 6 says, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God is working in you, Christian. He's working all things together for what? Bad? No, for what? Come on, for what? For good. God is working. God works, the scripture says, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Man, he's working all things together in your life for good. You rest in the Lord. You wait patiently for the Lord. You be still and know that he is God. That was God's word to the martyrs. That was the psalmist's words to you and to me. Then, verse 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then, the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. The sixth seal, if you're taking notes, God's judgment on the earth. God will judge the earth in the tribulation. The earth will be rocked with an earthquake. I live two miles from the epicenter of the 1989 quake in Santa Cruz, California. Two miles from the epicenter. My friend's house was there on a hill and it slid off the foundation and down the side of the house. Man, that was really cool when I was like, like fourth grade. I was like, that's awesome. I don't think, you know, the dad was thinking that. But man, that was an earthquake. But man, that pales in comparison to the judgment of God. The earth is rocked. The heavens roll back like a scroll. God will judge the earth in the tribulation. And verse 15, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the Bill Gates of the earth, the commanders, the Norman Schwarzkopfs, the mighty men, the Brooke Mosers, every slave, every free man, they hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they cried out to the mountains, 16, and the rocks fall on us. And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? The kings of the earth. The Vladimir Putins. The Ahmed Karzais. The Tony Blairs. They cry out to the mountains and to the rocks. But they don't cry out to the rock of ages. They don't cry out to God. Friend, when you are in trouble... And when you are in a tribulation, don't cry out to the mountains. Don't cry out to drugs or alcohol. Don't cry out to self-help. Don't cry out to Paxil or Zoloft. Cry out to the rock of ages. Cry out to God. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined. He heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, Psalm 40. Cry out to that rock. Save me, God. That was Peter's prayer, remember? Walking on water, drowning, there, going to be in the bottom of Davy Jones's locker. His prayer was, was not... Thou who art in heaven above, who beholdest with thine eyes. No, his prayer was, God help. Two words, God help. He cried out. Don't cry out to the rocks. Don't cry out to a friend. Don't cry out to something in a tin can or a glass bottle. Cry out to the rock. Cry out to Jesus and be saved. After these things, chapter 7, verse 1, stay with me. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. 
And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth from the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Pause. Wait a minute. Don't harm the earth or the sea until we have sealed the servants of God. What's that talking about? Builders used a seal for wood. When they shipped wood across the Adriatic Sea, where John was when he wrote the book of Revelation, when they shipped wood, they would seal that wood with a sign, with an insignia. When the wood arrived at its destination, the builder would say, that's my sign. That's my seal. That's my wood. And he would carry that wood away. Ephesians says, we are sealed for the day of redemption. God has sealed you. You have God's seal on you, Christian. You have God's sign. You are God's. God says, hey, you're mine, Jason. Hey, you're mine, Sam. Hey, you're mine, Justin. You are mine. And he carries you and me away. But here, the angel says, seal the servants of God. Who's that? Verse 4. I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. Wait a minute. It doesn't say that. 144,000 Seventh-day Adventists. Okay, it doesn't say that. No, it says of all the tribes of the children of Israel who were symbolic of America. No, it doesn't say that. Who were symbolic of the church. No, it doesn't say that. It says... Verse 5, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Reuben, is this hard to understand for you guys? No. The tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Gad, how many? 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Asher, how many? 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Naphtali? The tribe of Manasseh? The tribe of Simeon? 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. 144,000 Jews. They are God's chosen people. You are not a Jew. Well, if you're not a Jew. I am not a Jew. We are not symbolic of the Jews. America is not symbolic of the Jews. The church is not symbolic. No, the Jews are the Jews. And they are God's chosen people. People with anti-Semitic hearts or people with false teachings say the Jews crucified Christ. The Jews failed. Have you failed though? Have you? Nod your head. Yes. I'll answer that for you. You have failed. The Jews, man, they dropped the ball and they blew it. But I've dropped the ball. I blew it. Jesus has not turned his back on the Jews. Because Jesus hasn't turned his back on you, has he? Cam? On you, Anna? No. On you, Crystal? No. He hasn't turned his back on me. He will not leave us nor forsake us. And 144,000 Jews are saved in the tribulation. They are saved. Right now, Israel is, scary to say, anti-God. Their hearts are hardened to Jesus. But in the tribulation, 144,000 Jews will be saved. And they will be sealed. Speaking of identification, they are God's and protection. They will survive the tribulation. They will not be murdered or martyred because they are sealed. 144,000 Jews. And verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number. Not 144,000. No, a great multitude of all nations. Not just Jews. But of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Africans, Americans, Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, all nations. Before the throne, here we flash to heaven. Like when you're in a movie and you flash from so-and-so to so-and-so. Here we flash from the tribulation on earth to a great multitude there in heaven. Before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, verse 9, symbolizing purity. And with palm branches in their hands, symbolizing praise. And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
Doesn't that make you want to grab a guitar and start singing? Man, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. A great multitude of all tribes, nations, tongues are saved in the tribulation. 144,000 Jews are saved. A great multitude of Gentiles are saved. They are not sealed and they are murdered. We're going to read in a minute. They are martyred, but they are in heaven worshiping the Lord. Thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven, on earth. Worship the Lord. Then, verse 13, one of the elders answered. Okay, think with me. Was there a question asked? Was there? What am I doing? Not in my head. No, there wasn't a question asked. But one of the elders answered, saying to me, John, writing the book, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, uh, you know, in other words, uh, I don't know. Who are these, John? An elder asks a question. We talked about elders a couple weeks ago. An elder is a man marked by what? Maturity. Eight times in the book of Revelation, we read about the elders. And eight times there are lessons to learn if you want to be a man or a woman of maturity, spiritually. What's the lesson here? The elder here, chapter seven, asks a question. He sparks and ignites a spiritual conversation. Hey, John, who are these guys? The white robes and the palm branches, the dress things going on. Who are these guys? Uh, I don't know. Let me tell you. And he answers the question. He starts a spiritual conversation. If you want to be a man or a woman marked by maturity, start spiritual conversations with people. Every Friday night, say, God bless you, stay and talk. But I'm not encouraging you to talk about movies. I am Batman. I'm not encouraging you to talk about music. I'm exhorting you to start spiritual conversations. Sean, you are Batman, okay? <laughs> I'm encouraging you to start spiritual conversations. Oh, I pray that right now you hear the word, and I pray that this is the day you are a doer of the word, and I am a doer of the word. If right here and right now we will learn the lesson, Friday night gang, of starting spiritual conversations, man, we will mature spiritually. Learn to say, hey, man, how you doing today? Uh, good. Hey, did you read this morning's proverb? Uh, no. Well, I did. Let me tell you what I read. <laughs> proverb says the well in the mouth of a righteous is the well of life. Do you know what that means? Uh, no. Let me tell you what that means. That means when we are filled with the living waters of the spirit, our mouths, so on and so forth. You think I'm joking? I'm not joking. Start spiritual conversation. How are you doing? Good. Are you really? Come on. How can I pray for you? So what's going on? Uh, not much. So you having sex with your girlfriend? What's going on? Let's talk. <laughs> what's going on? Start spiritual conversations to encourage people, to edify people, to convict, to convince people. Start spiritual conversations. If you want to be a man or a woman marked by maturity. The elder started and sparked a spiritual conversation. He said to him, sir, uh, you know, verse 14. So he said to me, answers the question, these are ones who came out of the great tribulation or who were saved in the tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. These are Christians who were murdered, yes, and who were martyred, yes, but washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Scripture says, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. You are a dirty, disgusting sinner. You're welcome. I am a dirty, rotten sinner of a man. God bless me. We are robed in the righteousness of Jesus. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. But you are covered, my friend, 
and cleansed. Your sin is forgiven, even if you can't forgive yourself. Your sin is forgotten, even if you can't forget that night. Your sin, Psalm 104 says, is cast as far as the east is from the west. Robes washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, verse 15, they are before the throne of God. Ah, that's a great place to be, Christian, before the throne. Hebrews says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace to find help and mercy in time of need. Come boldly to God's throne. That's a good place to be, a great place to be. And verse 15, they serve him day and night in his temple. That's a great thing to do, to serve God. Serving is a blessing. We think serving is a curse and receiving is a blessing. No, it's the other way around. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. You want to be blessed? Serve. Serve your church. Change diapers in the nursery or hang out with the children's ministry or set up chairs or do sound Matt Overstreet or do projection Matthew Comer or whatever. Serve and give your time, your talent, your treasure. You will be blessed. Serving is a blessing. They serve him day and night in his temple. A great thing to do. And verse 15, he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. That's God. Not off in the cosmos, not invisible to the eye. No, right there dwelling among you and me in heaven. Verse 16, they shall neither hunger anymore, nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. There won't be fans and no air conditioning. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's heaven, man. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. He wasn't talking about the great tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. No, he was talking about life. You're going to have trials, troubles, tribulations in life. You're going to cry tears in life. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. Don't cry. Do not weep. Rejoice in the Lord. Be of good cheer. Jesus said, for I have overcome the world. Jesus is the good shepherd. He leads you. And he leads me to fountains of living waters. In heaven, yes, and on the earth. Jesus said, he who believes in me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Speaking of the spirit. Rivers of joy. Rivers of peace, waters of love flowing out of you. Jesus, the good shepherd, you follow Jesus, my friend. You take up your cross and you follow Jesus. He will lead you through the valleys of life, the valleys of the shadow of death. He will lead you through the trials. He will lead you through the tribulations. He will lead you through the how long, O oh Lord. He's working in you. He will lead you to the green pastures and the quiet waters and the fountains of living waters in this life and the life to come. And there in heaven, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Every tear. Man, no more trials. No more tribulations. No more pains. No more problems. No more heartache, no more headache. Heaven, every tear wiped away from your eye. Heaven is home, Christian. Heaven is home. If you want a Christian, today's the day of salvation. Do you want to be with Antichrist and war and famine and death and judgment of God? No, you don't want to be there. Today is the day. Do you want to be in heaven? living waters, fountains of living waters. Today is the day of salvation. Talk to me. Talk to JP or Phil or Jimmy in the back. Talk to me and be saved in the name of the Lord. You and me, we're saved. Heaven is home. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Chapter 8, verse... No. Pray with me.